The following content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It does not constitute means for diagnosis, healthcare advice, nor treatment. Make use of a qualified healthcare professional for such purposes. Related pairs. Fire extinguisher and a fire. Makes sense. They go together. Um, or, you know, like a key and a glass. Not super um, intuitive, right? You don't think those things go together. And then you're interacting objects. Um, have your golf club and your golf ball. Looks like it's going to hit it. Or it's just in the picture sitting there. Two separate objects. So if you were reading a paper and this was, if you were reading that paper, the part of the paper that I read to you, and you didn't have this, do you think that you would actually know what the participants were looking at? <laughs> probably not, right? So if you're, um, I know you all are probably gonna end up in a lab at some point, um, you're gonna do some experiments and you're gonna write a paper about it. You're gonna probably wanna use a procedural figure uh, to help them your readers, which are going to be your grad students, probably, and help them know exactly what it is. Also, so people can um, replicate it if they want to. So this is another procedural figure. Uh, this illustrates uh, time, essentially. So in this paper, it says each trial begins with a fixation point. Typically, there's a faint placeholder, a square to mark each potential target location. One of the placeholders thickens as a cue, and a short time later, a target appears. So that's kind of pretty descriptive, but once you see this image, you know like this square here is going to highlight at 80 milliseconds. You've got a target that appears in that 240 milliseconds. Very exact, um, but we wanna make sure that we display these and we write about them right we don't use this in lieu of um writing so another procedural figure is a consort chart i don't use these um because i'm an experimental uh, but I'll, you'll see them more if you're in going to be in clinical is anybody planning on doing clinical yeah so you guys are probably do this. so this is for participation in their participant fest Essentially, they just fall off the study. They don't want to participate anymore. Um, you have your control in your experimental group. And you can see at the top where you start out with 101 participants. Um, and then as you go, you start losing people. You've got 51, 48, 40, 37. And we want to show people that that happens just because if um, you do get a significant effect of some sort. You want to make sure that people don't think that it's larger than it actually is. Like this, that the experiment that you're doing doesn't give a big result when it actually had a lot of people fall off of it. So for example, when we do this in clinical work, this example here is trying to show me how many people are going to be okay for this type of therapy 
and how many people are not okay, right? So for example, who is the best candidate for this type of therapy? So you have acceptance and commitment. So for example, when we started with the experimental and we started with the control, we had a lot of participants then. So we started with 50 people, and we started with 50 people, but then we started losing people. So we had 46 before, before we started doing therapy, and then four weeks into it, right, we have 41 people still remaining in the therapy. And then after week eight, we only have 39 people remaining, right? And after they completed the therapy, you notice that we did another assessment and we had, again, more participants. Than that. There were only 36 people out of that original 50 that were willing to participate in the research. And there were many reasons why they decided to leave. So for example, um, they had issues with their time and their scheduling. They didn't want to be part of it, just plain and simple. So we do consort just to consult whether or not someone would be eligible or adequate because not everybody's adequate for therapy. So that's what this is illustrating. All right, so all those figures you're gonna use um, in your procedures. Uh, these are going to be, the rest of the class is gonna be on data figures. Uh, so data figures illustrate uh, data patterns. They represent proportions, relationships, polynomial functions, main effects and interactions. And we're gonna go over all of those with pictures. So it's super easy to put together. So pie charts, pie charts illustrate proportions. Um, the circle represents 100%, right? Uh, you have your good and you have your bad. Uh, can somebody tell me why this one's so much better? Exactly, it's easier to read. Uh, you don't want to have a bunch of different uh, categories there because it just makes it really difficult. And you're using this to make sure that people understand uh, what your name is. In. So if you do have something where you have like a whole bunch of categories, that happens sometimes, would you just like split it into different charts or try to categorize the categories? Um, you could use a table. Oh, okay. um, you could also uh, group them together. It depends on what you're doing. So yeah, just make sure if everything you do, you want accessibility, the next one is going to be another uh, pie chart, and we'll talk about that, but making it easier for your uh, reader, right? We just want to make everything easier for a reader. This is 100%, right? Just by looking at it, we said it was pretty easy. What percent do you think um, of this chart? Let's say it's the pets that you guys have. Um, how many people, or what percent has 65. 65. Okay. So we have 65. Uh, what would the red be? 20. Okay. So we have 65, 20, 85. So we got to flip that between these two, right? So maybe we'll say 60, 20, 10. So the intent of any figure in any field, regardless of where you are, computer science, and psychology, the intent is to make it easy, is to summarize data. That is the intent of any figure. A really good example of a pie chart, and I'm gonna point out exactly why this one is really good. Not only do you have all the different colors, they're also in line with your colors that are listed here, your green, and your blue, and your yellow, orange, um, that makes it easy for people who are possibly colorblind. Um, if there's a list and it goes in order, right? So make sure you think about that when you're making your charts. Um, also, we have the actual percentage in here, so there's no guessing. There's no 65. We know it's 60. So if we want to um, illustrate relationships, um, we're going to use a scatter plot. So you have your x-axis which is your predictor variable. Um, that's also considered your independent variable. But don't get confused because when you're doing these, you don't normally manipulate the independent variable. It's just something that you've observed. Um, and then your y-axis is going to be your criterion variable or your dependent variable. These are some examples of correlations. Um, they're called, these are positive correlations because 
the both of the variables are going in the same direction. Um, when you hear positive correlation, think lower, lower left to upper right. Okay. Um, positive doesn't mean good. Positive is just a direction. Positive is lower left upper right. Can anyone tell me um, if they know of any perfect positive correlations? There's not a lot like in nature, right? Nothing really predicts things that well normally. Okay, yeah, there could be. Honestly, for me, the more I get, um, I lose sleep, I kind of get like a toddler. Um, and so I go get the zoomies really bad. So there could be variants in that. Um, one that I've heard has been how many feet you have and how many socks you would wear. So if you have one foot, you would wear one sock. If you have two feet, you would wear two socks. Yeah, that would be true. That's a good one. Though. <laughs> So you can see your numbers here. If it's perfect, it's one. Uh, if positive, perfect, it's positive one. Um, with a little bit of variance, you've got a highly positive correlation. That's 0.8. And then a low positive would be like 0.3. Um, and then no, no correlation would be zero. I've got some examples for you. Um, if you're going to stay in psychology, you're probably going to hear on this a lot. Um, so like if you were thinking of a low positive correlation, it might be ice cream sales and traffic accidents. Your ice cream sales might go up because it's sunny outside and it's warm. Um, people might be right at driving towards the sun and get the sun in their eyes and have more car accidents. There's not a lot of correlation there, but there's some, right? So it's still going in that direction. Um, a good example for no correlation would probably be ice cream sales and assignments you complete in this class. There's no correlation. So negative correlations are just the opposite, right? They don't, they're not bad. They're just the opposite direction. So the upper left to the lower right. If you have a perfect negative correlation, negative one. An example of that, students who have high absences in this class will have a lower grade, right? Because it's mandatory, right? So every time you miss, you lose a point. So that would be a perfect uh, negative correlation. A high one could be hot chocolate sales and temperature. Um, so if you, if it's hotter outside, then people will probably buy less hot chocolate. And then a low might be hot chocolate sales and shark attacks. Uh, people go out more and get in the ocean when it's sunny, and they don't really get out in the ocean when it's, or they get in the ocean when it's sunny. Their relationships are the uh, ones we just went over. So that first right there says linear. Um, you'll see those in your Pearson correlations. The second order is quadratic, and that's normally a U-shape or an uh, inverted U-shape, and you'll see those in stress research or arousal. The third order is cubic, and that comes out like an N-shape. An example of this is your perceived independence from your parents, um, and this happens for most people. I know it happens for me. Um, so you're a toddler and you really need your parents, right? You can't hold your head up, whatever your baby. And then you're a toddler and you know, you're like, oh, I can walk on my own. Need you for that. Um, you get to be a teenager, like, I don't need you guys, please leave me alone. Um, then you, so you've got perceived independence up here. You're like, I want to go out in the world on my own. Then you get in your 20s, mid 20s, and you're like, I don't know how to do my test. I don't know how to buy a car. Where am I going to live? What's the best choice to make? I should probably ask my parents. So that starts to go back up, right? Or go down. And then um, as you get older and you learn these things, you learn all the things that your parents know. And eventually they die, right? So you probably. So a couple other functions. You got your linear. We already talked about those. Um, 
Then there's the J shape. Here's more dark stuff. Um, so over time, if you think about the J shape function, over time, the population was kind of like, okay, we had a couple of people, everything's gone. And then the industrial revolution and the agricultural revolution happened and it shot way up, right? And we're an S-shaped rise plateau is, okay, we're going along, the revolutions happen, they keep going up, and then we don't have enough food to sustain everybody to keep going, right? So it kind of plateaus at some point where we can actually sustain those people. These are just pictures of those that we just went over. A constant function, if you guys are big nerds like me, you might want to actually know what your equation would look like. So a constant uh, would be like y equals 2. It's just on that y-axis straight line. A linear function would be something like y equals 2x, because it has that slope. Quadratic function would be like x to the second minus 1, and that to the second is what makes that bump, right? So when you get to the cubic function, cubic function would be like x to the third minus one. So two to the second is one bump. The third is two bumps. What do you guys think that's one is? Yeah, to the fourth, because the second one's the third. So um, now we're going to move on to how you would uh, work with experimental data. In experimental data, you have your independent variables. And those contain your levels, cells, conditions, groups. Um, your independent variable is going to be on your x axis. Your dependent variable, I know I heard her say when, you, uh, when I was in here the other day, you hear a dependent variable, you hear a measure, right? So that's your measurements. It's on the y axis. Um, and then these are probably going to contain error bars as well. And that represents your standard error. Make sure you read your text under the figures uh, to confirm that it's standard error, because there are some cases where you use um, confidence intervals and they kind of look the same. So just make sure you're aware of that. The R charts are best for discrete and categorical data, uh, that being like color or a type of stimulus. The charts have the means represented and the standard, standard error bars, the capital T's, I guess, um, on the top of those bars. And then the color of the bars indicate the factors when there's two or more. So here's an example. Independent variable down here at the bottom. This is iris. And this is different um, breeds of that flower. We have the dependent variable on the y-axis. And that's uh, the measurement, right? So we're trying to figure out uh, the fecal width. width. The mean is represented by the top of the bar, and then the error bars are sitting there on top. As I said before, if there's more than one factor, you can differentiate those by color. So this has two factors. It's uh, sunlight and species, two sunlight conditions and two uh, three species conditions. Red is your full sun. If these are in full sun, how much they grew. And then the blue is in part sun. We have our red maple, our sugar maple, and our black maple. And now we can see how big these trees grew depending on the sun that they were allotted, right? So this is another bar chart. So there's one thing that I wanted to point out for this one, and that's the dependent uh, variable here. Notice how it is starting at 40 and going to 65, it makes that bar chart seem like there's a big difference, right? But on the low test anxiety or the high test anxiety. Try to imagine if that was from zero to 65. Do you think that you see a big difference? No, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we're not making people see what we want them to see and actually show them the data, right? Sometimes when you are looking at data, and that tends to happen a lot when you're like dealing with pharmaceuticals, for example, they'll say, look at this bar chart. Our medication works so well. 
right? It's because they have zoomed in like this image here. It looks like it was a fake death friends. But in reality, say for example, the vine illustrated on the on the board, that original chart, if I were to show it how it should actually be, right? So say from 100, right, to zero. And if I were to show it how it should be illustrated, right? And this is gonna be, uh, right? So imagine that I had low test anxiety. And if you take my medication, I'm saying, well, if you take my medication, you're going to have low test anxiety. So now that difference, right? And that's the same picture that you guys have on your screen. Let's see, that one is about a little bit over. And then you have 50. So if you look at that illustration, that difference doesn't look that dramatic. When compared to, say, for example, the rest of the image, right? A lot of people do this to misinterpret or I should say misrepresent results, right? So that's one of the reasons when you are consumer of research, right? For example, when you get your master's in whichever field, you become a consumer of research. So you need to be very aware that some people will illustrate it just like on your power. They try to illustrate it like there was a big difference. When in reality, well, we have almost a 50 point difference here, right? So was it truly significant, right? Was it truly as dramatic as we think it was? Line charts have kind of the same thing going on as bar charts, and we'll look at those side by side here in a second. And the same um, standard error bar. Line charts are best for continuous variables uh, like time, something that can keep uh, being divided. They're best for illustrating interactions if you have a multifactorial design. Um, and they use different color lines to uh, represent different levels of a factor. So the next figure is going to contain um, two factors, six by two design. Um, that's six different points in time and two rates, high or low. You'll see that time is on the x-axis. And rate is represented as blue or red. We'll also notice that it's, um, I will tell you now, it is um, representative of an interaction. Your main is shown by the point. You have your different colors, right, for high or low. You have time and mean responses. Um, you know that this is an interaction because the lines are not parallel. If they were parallel, um, you wouldn't have an interaction, but because these start spreading uh, because of time, right, then there's an interaction between. Uh, this is another kind of line chart that doesn't have continuous variable. It's um, just like the one we saw earlier. So it's got the low test anxiety over here and the high test anxiety. You can see the X. X is like X marks the spot. It's an interaction. So if you're looking for an interaction, there you go, bingo. Uh, shows a relationship that us facilitating up here, which is the, the solid one, um, is high and low test anxiety, but it's low and high test anxiety. Temptation inhibiting um, is going to be low on low test anxiety and then high on high test anxiety. So if you want to use one of these different methods, you have to first know if they're going to have low or test anxiety, uh, low test anxiety or high test anxiety to know how it's going to affect you. So like I said, this, these, this is showing the same thing. Um, you may not be able to see the interaction as well here, uh, but you can over there. So if you're, if that's something that you're wanting to illustrate in your paper is that there is an interaction, that one's the one you're going to want to choose. If you're wanting to show that there is a significant difference, maybe not this one, because uh, remember we had to truncate it to make you actually see that was happening. So we don't want to do that. If you are looking for a main effect, you can see the difference um, in these two, main effect for A, main effect for B. Main effect for A is just a difference between A1 and A2. What I do, um, because you can't have an interaction, right? We have that X that had an interaction. You can still have a main effect for A and have an interaction. So if you want to make sure that you have that main effect for A, what I do is I average the space between these two lines here and here. And if they're different, 
uh, then you have the main effect. You can see if you average these two lines, there's no difference, it's a straight line, not a main effect for A. Main effect for B is just gonna be spread between those lines. These are really close together, right? So no main effect for B, but because they're spread apart. I want you to think about that interaction, right? So for example, an example of an interaction would be B, how many times you attend therapy, right? And how many times you attend religious services, right? So for example, we have the effect of A, right? And we have the effect of B, right? A being therapy and its interaction with attending religious services. So think about this. Think about the more you attend therapy, right? The least likely you are to report depression. For example, you have 100 and this is zero. So the more you attend the therapy, or let me illustrate some of the way. The more you attend the therapy, the less depression you have. What she's mentioning is that just because there is an interaction, for example, if you attend therapy every week plus attend religious services every week, there's a good chance that you're going to decrease your depression. That is an interaction. Therapy and religious services, right? The more you attend religious services and the more you attend therapy, the more likely there is to be an interaction. What she's saying is even just the main effect, just therapy can help you. It can have an impact on that dependent variable of depression. Okay? So just because there is an interaction, we can also determine in factor A, it is by itself had a main effect. And we know that's true. When you attend therapy, the least likely you are to experience depression. So that's what she's referring to main effect. Does that make sense? So like we kind of touched on before, there are tables as well that you can use. Um, this is really good for um, when you have a lot of data. So this key, this is a good way to keep your data organized. Um, Columns and rows and headings contain levels of the independent variable um, and labels for the dependent variable. Columns and rows contain your mean and standard deviations as well. So you can see if you were reading this, if somebody was writing it, right, you'd probably eventually get lost. And then seeing this in like a line chart or a bar chart, it would be a lot of information. You have your dependent variables here. And the levels of your factor here, you've got open condition and your traditional condition. Um, and then you have your inferential statistics, p-test, um, and whether or not it's significant. And then these little asterisks, love these little asterisks, significance, right? You want to look if they've got one and two, it just means it's either p level 0.05 or 0.01. So correlation tables present um, correlation coefficients or R. With multiple regressions, uh, there are beta weights that are reported. Show how much the criterion variable increases uh, with a particular variable is increased by one standard deviation, assuming the other variables in the model are held constant. It's a lot. Um, it's essentially just uh, how steep the slope is. Uh, the question being asked for this uh, looks kind of like, does childbirth have an impact on predicting distress in later years? You can see that you have two independent variables, um, the negative experience and the positive experience. Then there is also an interaction at the bottom. You see that negative times positive, that's the interaction. The negative experience would be like being born with an umbilical cord wrapped around your throat. Um, so that's not a good time. Um, and then the positive experience would be that there is no major issue, right? The interaction would be that you have both experiences. So like maybe you are all good, um, you were born and everything was fine, but you had an intern who was holding you and taking you to the table and dropped you. That's not good. So if you look at the um, negative experience of childbirth, there's a p-value of less than 0.05, which indicates significance. And then the beta weight says 0.27, which means the um, independent variable of negative childbirth experience explains 27% of variance in the dependent variable when predicting stress. And I showed you guys where the independent variable was, the dependent variable, and where your means are. Um, we're going to go over some stuff that um, you're going to see in your classes later. Um, and I'm going to try and get you guys to 
see if you can read them and we can figure out what the study is trying to say. So first we have Weber's law. Uh, what kind of function is Weber's law? Linear. Yeah, super easy. Great. Um, what about Fetcher's analysis of Weber's law? Curve linear. Awesome. Great. Super easy. So essentially what Weber's law is saying is that when you increase uh, the relationship between the stimulus intensity and your perception are linear. So when you increase y, it corresponds with the increase of x. Fletcher's analysis is the rate of change is going to carry as a function of where you are on x. So it's functions of this. J shape. Yeah, J shape. The brightness is curling here. The other way, right? So what's your independent variable? Awesome. Um, what is your dependent variable? Somebody over there. Yeah, exactly. Magnitude. So what this is saying is um, essentially for brightness, it's okay. Um, I'm in this room. This thing is shining in my face, um, and that's a little bit annoying. Um, if I look and then I look into the sun, that's really annoying. If I put that in front of my eyes while I'm looking at the sun, there's not going to be that much. Can anybody tell me what this one is? Linear, right. And then what are the other lines considered? Curve linear, great. Um, your independent variable. Rocket. Um, dependent variable. And you guys are so awesome. Great job. So this is essentially saying, um, shows that they're all, uh, someone hits all false alarms. Uh, so the options are false alarms, a miss, a hit, or you get all of them correct. D is uh, D equals zero is saying that they're all false alarms. And then the way this one shoots up for D4, this is for cognition or biopsych. Tell me what your independent variable is. Time. Dependent variable. Yes. And then where is your um, threshold? Negative 55. Right. So what about your peak action potential? Yeah, positive 30. This one is cool. So this chart, it has to do with conditioning. Continuous reinforcement of target behaviors eventually becomes less reinforcing. So uh, according to this, schedule of reinforcements, which one is, which one has the shortest amount of time to produce the um, best result? Yeah, variable ratio, right? Because it doesn't go that far on your timeline in it. You'll see a lot if you work with memory. So the idea is that, you know, if you're given a list of things, you're probably going to remember the first part and you're probably going to remember the last part, but you're not going to remember the middle part as well. Uh, what relationship is this, or, or what function is this? Quadratic, I heard it. Good job, quadratic. So I actually have a fun example, a real life application of this. Previously, I used to teach at another university. And when I was, when I was up for an interview, uh, they asked me, do you want an 8 a.m. appointment, which was the earliest interview they had, and then they had a bunch for the rest of the day. And they said, do you want the 8 or do you want the 2 o'clock? And I picked 8. And based on this, curve, on this quadratic relationship, why do you think I picked the 8 o'clock interview? Yes, sir. Correct. Because of this exposure, I know that if I'm the very first person they talk to or the last person they talk to, they're going to remember that more. Right, so hopefully, in that case, I did do a good job. So I was hired then, right? So remember that this does have a real life application, and I did. I was hired then, and I used to, I taught there for a while, and now I'm hired here with the bright minds of our institution. I do. I will say that um, as far as memory research that I've done, uh, if you focus on something right before you go to sleep, too, that's really good. So later might be better as far as boxes go. Yeah. I'm still awesome. awake. Yeah, same, same. <laughs> but yeah, you give me information, probably not gonna hang on to it. The forgetting curve, the retention for information drops about by 50% in 20 minutes, uh, and then a slower drop for every uh, 
about 30% after 24 hours, and then eventually it kind of dies out. Can somebody tell me what the different, like why we have the two different colors? You have your difficult path and your easy path, and you're comparing them in one chart there. Um, at low arousal, arousal, performance quality is low, probably due to boredom. High arousal performance quality is high, probably because of anxiety. And so if you were somewhere in the middle, um, your performance would be a lot better. So you don't want to be too overstimulated or understimulated. For instance, if she said, for example, I give you the final paper, but throughout the semester, you're completing a little bit at a time, right? So it's a challenge, but it's not a threat, right? It's not something that it's unbeatable, right? You do like three paragraphs at a time. Whereas imagine if I were to make it, you have to write the entire final paper due tomorrow. Right, that's too much of a high intensity. So chances are that your performance is going to be low. Whereas if I make it just enough challenging, it lights a fire, right? So you're actually okay to do, say, uh, in two weeks, let me start writing. But if I say it's due tomorrow, that is too much of a task, right? Because now you're gonna write a whole paper. But if I spread it out evenly, and it's not too easy either, what's going to happen? You're going to become bored. So you're probably, eh, let me just, before it's due, like at 11 30, let me just put something together. So that your performance is also going to be poor. So that's an example. You have to make it enough challenging to where you actually want to engage in the task, but it can't be too challenging because your performance is going to be low, but it can't be too easy. So for those of you who are in sports, how many people here are in, in, in sports or play or are in any sort of league? Or maybe in high school, right? So if you know that your team has not lost in like two years, the team that you are facing, chances are your performance is going to be low because it's too challenging. But if the team is super easy, right? If you know these people are amateurs, right? Your performance is also, you're not gonna perform your best, right? Because it's too easy. So you want to face a team that's in the middle. So that's what she is referring to. Use factor analysis uh, to explain variance and covariance between a set of observed characteristics. This shows the big five. I actually used to be uh, 16 personality traits. Um, Dr. Shar has told me that she still uses the 16 personality traits in her um, experiences, um, but they did a factor analysis in order to make it more compact. So this is um, a table of the big five um, that we were just talking about. And I wanted to just test you guys on a table as well. So can someone tell me which trait is most significant, um, has the most significant correlations at a 0.01 level? This level here, right? Yeah, remember from the other one, we had the one that had two stars and the one that had one star? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Openness. Openness has the most. Great. That's awesome. Um, can someone tell me which of the traits have significance at a 0.05 level? That's going to be a couple. Nar a narcissism? Okay. Consciousness. Okay. Great. Um, Y'all did awesome. Thank you for letting me teach your class.